So our next speaker is Kent Severson. Kent Severson is a conservator at Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Culture, and Design in Honolulu, Hawaii, where he is responsible for overseeing the care and preservation of Shangri-La's collection of Islamic art. He is a graduate of the NYU Conservation Training Program and was formerly in private practice in Boston, Massachusetts. He has participated in active archaeological excavations in Turkey, Greece, Italy, and Egypt. In 2010, 2011, and 2016 to 2017, he was a visiting instructor for the Iraqi Institute for the Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage in, I'm not going to say this right, in Erbil, Iraq. Severson is a fellow of the American Institute for Conservation. So in Kent's talk today is called The Playhouse at Shangri-La, a case study in the reintegration using an alternative material. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Shangri-La was the Hawaii home of the well-known philanthropist and heiress Doris Duke. The house is located on the on artificial shoreline um, terrace, an artificial shoreline terrace on the south side of the island of Oahu, um, just east of Diamond Head and Waikiki. Um, built as her honeymoon house and then used as her winter getaway and as a showcase for um, Doris Duke's collection of Islamic art, Shangri-La is now a museum and center for understanding Islamic art, culture, and design. You can learn more about Shangri-La at our website, www.shangrilahawaii.org. Shangri-La Hawaii, one word. So um, Doris Duke married a, a fellow named James Cromwell um, in February of 1935 and um, went on an around the world honeymoon as one does when one is fabulously wealthy. Um, and this included uh, his stops in the Middle East and India. So here we see um, Cromwell and, and Ms. Duke um, obviously after they got to Hawaii. And on the right you see um, Doris Duke at the Moti Mosque in Agra. Um, and it was during this trip that, that her love of, of Islamic art really blossomed. Hawaii was to be her final stop um, in August of 1935. They were going to stay for a couple weeks, and they ended up staying all the way through December, by which time they had already decided uh, that they would be building a, a kind of honeymoon house in Hawaii, and that at, at the core of it were going to be um, elements from uh, design from the Islamic world. So um, the land was purchased in 1936, construction in 30, began in 37, and they spent their first nights in the house in December of 1938. Um, <clears throat> by 1940, they were separated and Cromwell uh, never visited again. Um, <laughs> however, Ms. Duke uh, maintained a lifelong attachment to Shangri-La, um, adding to her collection of Islamic art and visiting um, Shangri-La right up until the months before her death in 1993. So in this view, you can see uh, uh, Shangri-La under construction. Um, you can see the massive terrace wall being built going up um, and along with the cast concrete walls of the house in the background. Now if you were sort of hovering there and you swiveled around magically in the air, oh wait, not quite to that one yet, sorry. Okay. Um, as part of the program for decoration at Shangri-La, Doris Duke commissioned a series of glazed ceramic tile mosaics in Iran. And on the left, you see a massive mosaic reproduction of one of the early 17th century panels from the Shah Mosque in Ifsahan, um, made for the central courtyard at Shangri-La. Uh, for scale, there are a couple little benches down by the side. And on the right, a detail of one of these works. Um, each of, these each of the, the pieces of the mosaic started out as rectangles of solid color that are hand cut um, and then fit together as a mosaic. So they're pretty amazing, dazzling things. And Miss Duke's commissions were part of an early 20th century revival of the craft. Now, if we swivel around in the air, playing with my friend Dan's drone, um, <laughs> you can see uh, this, this freestanding building at the end of the swimming pool at Shangri-La. Although there was one guest room in the main house, um, it was reserved for family and special visitors. 
Uh, most of the guests were lodged in this building. She liked her guests out there somewhere. Um, and it, became to known, be, be, it came to be known as the Playhouse. Um, it's a self-contained building with two apartments and an independent kitchen um, and two full bedrooms. Yeah. So among the 1938 tile commissions was the facade of the Playhouse, and this is the subject of my talk today. Um, the mosaic decorations consist of a band of dark blue background running along the bottom wall on both sides and around um, the large sliding glass window in the middle um, with narrow turquoise background bands around the smaller doors and windows and a pair of large turquoise background um, panels flanking the large uh, sliding glass door on either side. And in this image from 2004, you can see that there are, are damaged and missing portions that is on the viewer's left. Um, the surround around that, that window on the outside, and you can see, um, well, anyway, the missing um, surround around the window on the outside. At this corner of the, of the, the compound, there's a, a, a kind of perfect storm of degradation phenomena, including um, thermal expansion, that is, the sun beats down on this part of the building every single morning, like you see in this photograph. Um, there are wind-blown particles, as well as um, constant wetting from the surf spray, surf spray below. Okay, so uh, let's back up a bit. Oh, here's a, a detail of that area with the missing pieces. Um, backing up a bit, on the left is a photograph of the dealer, Rabino, in his studio in Iran, um, showing off um, the workshop where these pieces were actually made. And you can see the craftsman with using these chunks of stone as an anvil and the little ads going tick, 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 um, cutting out these individual pieces. It's an amazing thing. And on the right, you see our actual playhouse um, facade decorations laid out face down. Um, and in fact, if you go to the internet, you can find a number of videos showing this technique. Uh, most of them come from workshops in Morocco today. But it, it's still kind of alive and well, and um, it, it's really quite fascinating. So at this point, um, our panels were, were backed with a kind of thick mortar um, that was divided into sections uh, about this wide by about a foot and a half wide. Um, And, and then these are the, uh, the panels that were shipped to Shangri-La. And the blueprint that you see in the lower right is a, a kind of installation diagram that came with the panels. So each of the panels was numbered um, B4, B5, B6. And this was a diagram as to how they were to be laid out on the, in the installation. Now it turns out that the, the mortar that um, traditionally holds these individual ceramic pieces together in, in Iran is gypsum based. And you can see where I'm going with this um, and, and why installing these next to the ocean might be something of a problem. So the, um, the decay of these tiles, of course, started decades ago, um, but there, there's not a lot of documentation. Um, we have some receipts for repairs um, during the 70s. We have this early photograph, the one on the upper left, um, which shows that window surround in terrible condition. Um, this sort of enigmatic picture uh, from 1988 on the upper right where that entire section was disassembled and then reassembled, partly on a new substrate. Um, and one of the door surrounds from 1992, that, that photograph actually had a date on it, which where you can see some pretty significant problems. Um, there was a campaign by Carl's Plastering, I have no idea who this person was, um, in, the, in the 90s where um, if you think about it, that whole section had been disassembled. It was then partially reassembled and then reassembled again on a new substrate, a concrete substrate. Um, and it looks really great in the lower right photo, um, but most of that is paint, actually. Um, my predecessor at Shangri-La, Molly Lambert, who many of you know, um, Val valiantly tried to, to capture and save some of these pieces as the degradation continued, but it really was, was too late um, by the 2000s. And um, on the lower right is a, a shot of um, conditions of the last remaining section uh, at that corner in 2016. 
So the stresses that, that are affecting these mosaics include, as I said, the, the diurnal thermal expansion, which opens little cracks, um, wind pushing particles in and salt spray into the little cracks, which prevents them from closing when they cool down, um, condensation and rain events running even more water in the, in the openings, and also causing this mortar to swell. This gypsum mortar swells a lot when it gets wet. Well, then the door is open and, and everything can, can um, progress uh, more rapidly. Um, so repeated wetting and drying, like with mud brick, causes um, everything to get very powdery. It's always windy. Um, there's a wind erosion. And then the, the fit between the glaze and the substrate is really poor uh, to start with. And they were all created by impact. So you have micro cracks everywhere. Um, once they get to a certain point, there's no, there's no turning back. Um, here you see a, a typical section of what was survived and what hadn't already collapsed um, with uh, flaking. There's a lot of bulging of the mortars underneath. Um, it, it's like everything you can think of happening at the same time. So uh, by 2016, we were, we were seeing this kind of conditions. Um, and after much thought and discussion, uh, it was concluded that the most, the most degraded sections of tiles, those that survived, had to be removed and replaced. And this wasn't an easy decision. Um, no one likes to cut apart pieces of art, but um, it's a special case where, where these things, these beautiful mosaics that were manufactured um, for one uh, kind of environment were really put in a very compromising environment next to the sea. So we did it with as much um, grace and dignity as we could. Um, a lot like recovering mosaics at an archaeological site, they were faced, uh, registration lines were drawn, of course they were photographed, and with long flattened chisels, they were loosened from their substrates. This was done up to a point, and that point is, um, well, you'll see it in a minute, um, where, where there's sufficient stable tiles that we felt we could preserve them in situ. And everything else in the facade, as long as the roof holds and there aren't any other um, issues, these things actually do survive at Shangri-La. So we were pretty conservative about what we took down. So once we took them down, we started seeing things like, um, in the image on the left, you can see a B9. And that was the painted image that corresponded with the blueprint that we saw a little bit earlier. It's sort of interesting that B9 did not end up exactly where it was supposed to on the blueprint, but <laughs> never mind. Um, and on the right, the upper right, you see the back of one of these panels um, where the, the brown mortar from Iran had separated away. And it looks very much like the um, shop photo that we saw with all the little fragments face down. And so these were, these were lowered to the ground, face down, mortars removed in there on a rack in the basement. Um, and so we, we have actually preserved them such as they are. Okay, so up to this point, and we have these great huge commissions at Shangri-La, the big piece in the patio and, and a number of other ones around. Um, we really didn't know how they'd been installed. There were no records. And so we, we pulled them down, and you can see the brown mortars, the thick brown mortars from Iran, and you see lots of gray cement and then you see lots of white. And it, 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 um, the way they were installed is these panels were set up against, not right against the wall, the substrate wall, the structural wall, but near it, um, about an you know, inch or so away, and held in place with little bits of copper wire as clips. And then cement slurry was poured in behind. Fair enough, that'll hold them. Um, <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, they had trouble. They were struggling with these things, keeping them in position. And so oftentimes, they also started pouring plaster of Paris in on top of the cement. And that's what the white material you see. Now, we started, I mean, we started looking at this substrate, thinking, what can we say? What do we need to go? What needs to go? And we, we realized that in many places, that mortar that they poured in was shattered. So we started taking it off, and it's like, Oh, now I know why we had so many problems with these things. There's rusting rebar underneath. And I, it seems like in many areas, um, it's basically a cast concrete building. Um, the tiles arrived. The tiles didn't exactly conform to what was cast, and they would trim it back and then install the tiles with plaster of Paris 
and, and new cement right against the untreated rebar. Well, I think everyone knows that plaster of Paris on, on raw steel is like a festival of rust. So, uh, yeah. so we scaled everything, dug out all the shattered cement, treated the iron, um, and let the healing begin. Um, we built up ca new cast concrete substrates. Um, and you can see in these, this photograph on the upper left clearly where I said, okay, this is where we stop and everything else will be replaced. Okay, so long before we got to this point, we asked ourselves, what are we going to replace these with? Um, and we actually investigated having new tiles made, new mosaics made in Iran, replacing in kind. Um, and we threw this gentleman, his name is Yunus Saki, who is a, a local engineer who is going back and forth to Iran. We actually acquired some samples. Um, the color and the quality of the glaze was killer, it was spot on, but there were problems with cutting. They're, the modern tiles are too hard, so when they went to cut them, they, they tended to shatter a bit around the edges. Um, and the cost of, and the logistics of doing this in Iran seemed a little um, improbable. And we also, it occurred to me that if we did it in a mosaic fashion again, we'd still have the same problems. Um, with water and salt intrusion, and eventually we'd have these same kind of issues. And so um, M Molly Lambert, my, my predecessor at Shangri-La, had the idea that maybe we needed something different, an alternative material to replace this with. And she suggested this back in 2012 or 13. Um, and she actually compiled a kind of requisition package um, which I developed a bit and eventually submitted, submitted it to seven tile farms. Um, some of which bowed out right away, um, one of which proposed a photoreprographic technique on porcelain substrate, um, seen here. The problem is with something like this, you've got to get all the colors right at, at the same time, and this was really hard, and it had a kind of blurry quality, and it was not really very um, satisfactory. Another firm, however, came up with an idea that involved um, some stenciling and um, custom colors for each of the colors in the mosaic, um, again, on, on a porcelain substrate. Um, and the name of this firm is Windsor Fire Forum in Tumwater, Washington. And they did a fabulous job, and we were very happy to um, have them uh, help us with this project. They also came up with the great idea of, um, of using a water jet to cut along the, the edges of the pattern. Um, to help suppress the grid pattern that would have resulted from using 12 by 12 tiles um, and, and essentially making like a jigsaw puzzle. And you can see that in the, the upper photograph in the right. Um, so these were their samples that they sent. And on the basis of that, we were, we were pretty enthusiastic. So how do we get there? Um, the technique we, we ended up putting together involved um, high quality digital images that they had very low um, distortion and a lot of measuring. Um, on, the, on the right you see Leslie Tick Tika, who was a technician from Windsor Fire Forum, came out, did measurements and did, um, worked out through the color matching. Um, and the images were then um, scaled digitally and what we thought we would be doing is using the um, sort of well-preserved right-hand section, take the digital images, turn them around, fix a distortion, um, get them all keyed together. And somewhere in the middle of this, I started looking at it and realized that the two sides were not symmetrical. So in the upper photograph, you see the well-preserved right-hand side all set up. And in the left-hand side, you see um, the deteriorated viewer's left side. And if you look at the, what's in the square, that actually should be the other way around. And likewise, that medallion should be rotated 90 degrees. And why there's this broken symmetry, I don't know. I asked Carol Beer, um, who is a scholar that studies this, and she said, well, sometimes it happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, Carol. Okay. 
So through the miracle of, of digital manipulation in Photoshop, we could correct those things. And what you see on the top now is the deteriorated left-hand side. In the bottom, one of um, Windsor Fire Farm's working drawings. This is a much, much reduced version with the dimensions, everything, um, all the distortions corrected and put together. Okay, so uh, Brian Stockdale, president at Windsor, um, I'm paraphrasing his description of the process. Um, the digital images were imported and scaled to appropriate full-size dimensions. The photographic dimensional distortions were corrected. The full-size photographic image is separated into individual tile shapes, creating a separate digital tile per file. Each unique tile is again separated into individual color layers. The water jet cut the tiles, and then they were masked with digitally cut masking layers. Um, subsequent colors were applied in a variety of means. Um, and then each tile was fired up to as many as six times. Um, they really went out of their way to make this work. So here you see some of the, the serographs, um, some of the partially glazed pieces um, set up with the, one of the drawings on the, on the left. These are the turquoise background pieces all lined up like soldiers coming out of the kiln um, and starting to, to lay them out. I like this one because the glare on the left, you can sort of see the jigsaw cut patterns. So um, it's like the day after New Year's on, of 2017, this year, they finally arrived and um, we were quite thrilled to carry them down and start laying them out in front of the, where they were headed. Um, and here they are all laid out for installation. And done. That was easy. Uh, actually, that took about four hours. And um, it just went off like a dream. I mean, it's like you know, months and months, years of, of preparation. And when it came down to installation, it was just no problem at all. OK, so here we are installing the trim parts, um, the parts around the door. Some of this had to be done by hand. We had great installers. They did a terrific job. There's that window that um, was kind of out over the sea. And here we are at the before and after, uh, and symmetry is restored. Another, yeah, another, it's a conservation paper. You have to have before and after pictures. It's, it's in our bylaws. Um, right. So the difference is only perceptible when you get about you know, 10 to 15 feet away and at certain angles. And um, hopefully this will be sufficiently durable to hold up to these harsh, harsh conditions. Um, so having finished the replacement part, uh, we still have a lot of work to do um, in, in treating the, the in situ parts. Um, there are all these, uh, anywhere you have a problem, you dig a little bit and you'll find the iron. It's always there. Um, and so we have to do a lot of surgeries, facing sections, removing them, cutting out the iron, rebedding them. But we've got the systems all worked out, but that's, that's another paper. Interestingly, Shortly after installation, I was wiping off some salty scum from these things, and some of the green started coming off on my damp sponge. And like, Ugh. okay, so <laughs> moment of panic. That, so, um, and there was a white that was coming off too, but it was only coming off of two tiles. So, um, um, Brian and I figured out that those two tiles just never got their last firing. In, in the massive production of these things. And, um, you know, they have all the digital files, and so they just generated two replacement parts, which this was last week, finally arrived, and we just click, click, took out the old ones, and the other ones snapped right in. So this bodes well for if we need to repair something or if we need to go in and, and replace other sections going forward. So the Charter of Venice in Article 9 talking about restoration, says they must be distinct from the architectural composition and must bear a contemporary stamp. And in Article 12 says replacements of, missing, replacements of missing parts must integrate harmoniously with the whole, but at the same time must be distinguishable from the original so that the restoration does not falsify the artistic or historic evidence. So I think um, we've been pretty successful in finding that middle path, um, reintegrating the facade um, and although using an, an alternative material, um, making it whole again. So thank you very much.
Does anyone have any questions? Is there any craft ones? I don't know if we have the microphone. Microphone? Oh. 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 Susie asked how much they cost. Yeah. Um, remarkably, the replacement parts just under seventy thousand uh, dollars. But the the big plus is that now we know how to do it, and if we have problems elsewhere in the future, we we know how to do it. So far, um, the work on the in situ materials has really um, been pretty successful. Molly started down the path um, using lime mortars and and you know. Uh, appropriate things. They need to be tweaked a little bit. I think we got it. Um, what was a little more difficult was getting the substrate flat and getting it in the right place. The construction guys had a hard time with that. Anybody else? Oh, well, thank you very much.